Welcome to Faith in Politics, a show dedicated to discussion issues surround the intersection of church, state, and politics, and the examination of whether you're allowing your faith to shape your politics, or your politics starting to shape your faith. In other words, what do you do when God and government come face to face? I'm your host, Orlin Johnson. Let me introduce you to our roundtable of regularly scheduled panelists. First, we have Mr. Todd McFarland, Deputy General Counsel for the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now we have Mr. Tim Schultz, who's the president of First Amendment Partnership. We have Dr. Lawrence Brown, who's the senior pastor of the Queensboro Seventh-day Adventist Church in New York City. And we have Dr. Timothy Golden, who's a professor of philosophy at Whitman College. Gentlemen, great having you here with us and looking forward to our conversation today. You know, Governor Ron DeSantis recently signed a law that would allow volunteer chaplains in Florida public schools, although one religion may not be able to use this law. The legislation creates a statewide program in which school districts and charter schools can allow volunteer chaplains on school campuses to provide counseling to children. However, the Satanic Temple may not be allowed to volunteer as other religions are allowed to. For some reason, Governor DeSantis decided that he wanted to exclude, quote unquote, this particular group. He says Satanism is not a religion and that is not qualifying it to participate because, quote unquote, they disagree with what the governor's statement may be. And despite Governor DeSantis contempt for religious liberty, some would say the Constitution guarantees, I believe, equal treatment under the law for all groups. But when you take a look at these type of matters where now you have a group that's coming in or you have a government or a government leader that's coming in to specify that there may be a group that doesn't fall within the category of quote unquote being religious, it starts to beg the question of if that group can be excluded, maybe there's some other group that may be excluded as well. You know, Tim Golden, when you hear these type of things going on and you wonder about, you know, what's a real religion, what's not a real religion, is Satanist for real? Are they simply just groups that want to engage in litigation? How do we try to make sure that we can parse through this and not quote unquote end up discriminating against a group that some may just be uncomfortable with? Well, I think you have to balance two impulses. I have a, a legal impulse, which tells me that if you're going to allow some religions to send to have volunteer chaplains, you have to allow all of them. And Satanism claims to be one. And we shouldn't have government uh, officials in the business of deciding what's a religion and what's not. That's not the way we should do it. That's my legal impulse. My political impulse and as a practical matter, is a little suspicious of the law that DeSantis has has uh, signed, but more suspicious of the Satanists who claim to be uh, uh, making an honest, good faith attempt to uh, participate as part of this government program. I I'm curious as to what kind of counseling services they would provide to high school students that would actually be constructive, right? So I am a little suspicious of them. I, I'm, I'm more suspicious of them than I am of Governor Ron DeSantis, who, yeah, you know, he has a certain political agenda and you know, Florida is where woke goes to die. And it's no secret that in some sense, he is very much uh, close to the right wing fringe or extreme. So I, I'm a little suspicious of the law, which to me seems to be harmless in the end because these are people, he's merely providing access to people who want to volunteer to come to the school. So I have my suspicions on both ends, but the Satanists, I, I think anybody who who serious, who takes them seriously is is really not looking at reality. I'm I'm struggling to figure out what kind of constructive counseling services they would offer to to high schoolers or to public school children. So that's my take on this. I think the legal and the political are, for me at least, in tension with one another. So Todd, in the state where woke came to die, I guess, um, how, how do we try to juxtapose, quote unquote, maybe what is a religious group? I, I don't even know what a Satanist chaplain you know, looks like, or well, how does that come into play? Uh, you know, has to be authorized by some group. Uh, give me some clarity on this. 
Sure. So first, you know, what Governor DeSantis said is that they wouldn't qualify under the bill. It's not like the bill says no Satanist may come in. What he said was, well, they're not a religion, therefore they won't qualify. First of all, you should never trust a politician when they say what a bill will and won't do. First, that would require them to have actually read the bill, which oftentimes <laughs> is the case. Second, it would require them to understand the bill, which they're often incapable of doing. And even if they get over their first two hurdles, the third hurdle is they're looking at it through a purely political lens. And, and no governor, even Kevin Newsom in California, would have a hard time signing a bill letting Satanists into schools, right? That, that would be hard. So I think that's the first thing. I do think, given the Satanist litigation strategy, they have oftentimes been able to win on the issue that they're a religion. Uh, and I suspect even in Florida, they'll do the same. But again, I echo Dr. Golden's uh, <clears throat> remarks, like, what are the numbers that are actually there? What are they going to offer? Are they going to truly participate? Or is this going to be one of those things where they just litigate for the right to go in? Somebody shows up once and then they sort of abandon this. I mean, volunteering in a public high school, you know, takes a lot of commitment and effort. And we'll see who actually is willing and able to do this. Well, here is, uh, for me, the elephant in the room. I understand that many entities uh, employ chaplains, even places like Microsoft and Google. They, they all have chaplains. I, I get that. But for me, the elephant in the room is there's a reason why the public school system is the public school system. And there's a reason why there is a built-in divide between uh, the public school system and religion. I went to church school. I'm happy I went to church school. I benefited by going to church school. And for people who want a certain um, influence or dynamic or effect in their lives, go to church school. You open Pandora's box when you take a public school system and you want to inject into it uh, this whole uh, concept of Christian chaplains, hence the law of unintended consequences, you might become the governor that invited Satanists to come in and counsel your children. So why don't we let the public school operate as a public school and we'll send the chaplains to the church schools where, that's the, where they should be in the first place? Mm. Well, you know, Dante said there were nine circles of hell, and I'm going to suggest that there's actually a tenth circle, and it goes something like this. Jimmy, you've just suffered from school detention. Please come to the office. We'd now like you to have a meeting with the satanic chaplain. That's the tenth <laughs> circle. By the way, I would say one other thing, uh, just talking about chaplains. So I do um, – um, I'm legal advisor, believe it or not, for the Adventist Church's ministry for chaplains. We're recognized ecclesiastical endorsers by the Department of Defense, which is sort of the one of the longest standing entities. Satanists are not on there. They could apply. They would have to go through the process. They'd have to meet all the criteria DOD sets. They haven't done that probably because they can't do it. Um, and I, I feel like, and I disagree with Dr. Pastor Brown here a little bit, um, you know, chaplains, as properly understood, are meant to serve in public spheres, corrections, health care, um, also in the Department of Defense. We've had chaplains in the military going back to George Washington's time. They know how to serve in a multi-faith environment. They're not there to proselytize, and they don't violate anyone's religious beliefs. And so I think the concern, though, is given this program, you know, are you slapping a label of chaplain onto people and onto something that really doesn't represent what chaplaincy does in all of its other settings, including the industrial or work settings that you know, made reference to? But Tim Schultz, let me ask you this though. I mean, when you start deciding that you're gonna exclude a group that you're not even sure if they're a real group, don't you actually end up providing them even more what I would call airtime than necessary if it really turns out that maybe they couldn't even satisfy the quote unquote requirements of being a chaplain to actually be talking about it where you exclude them in some way just seems like you end up just even bringing more light to that particular organization. I think it was inevitable that there was going to be publicity about it because I think that these Satanist groups kind of exist for publicity. That's their whole purpose. You really think they want to have a vigorous satanic chaplain program? Come on. They spend 95% of their time on publicity and litigation. 
I actually agree with Dr. Golden. I think that like they are marginally serious about being a religious group. It kind of reminds me of how atheists used to create this religion called the, the religion of the flying spaghetti monster. Um, unfortunately, unlike the flying spaghetti monster, Satan is real. But I think that the number of people who are actually real Satanists in an organized religious sense is like practically zero. And, you know, again, I we talked we've talked off air a little bit about you know, criminal gangs that incorporate Satanism into their rituals, that's actually real and that's actually scary. But the kinds of people that are actually going to want to have a chaplaincy program that's vigorous and rigorous and real, that are Satanists, I mean, that number approaches zero and it might be less than zero. Well, Dr. Golden, how do I juxtapose this, though, when where I'm in a country where, quote unquote, you're allowed to establish what you believe from a, quote unquote, religious perspective, you know, the definition of religion or the understanding of what somebody may claim may be their religion? I mean, isn't that the purpose of the whole protection of the First Amendment, that you allow what some may call the lunatics who have certain beliefs that they call religious? to be able to move forward and to operate. I mean, it sounds like we're carving back the First Amendment just for a particular group because of a discomfort we have, maybe even with their names. Well, you know, Orlin, one of the most compelling things about American law and the American legal system is that we have these, these baked in antagonisms, right? <clears throat> these baked in tensions that ultimately don't get resolved until one of the until we go to court and one of the litigants realizes, like Todd McFarland said, you know what? I'm probably not really a religion. I'm just in this for the attention. And it fizzes out. There's no avoiding these kinds of tensions and conflicts. I've always said that when you read the First Amendment, there's all there's an inherent t antagonism between the establishment clause and the free exercise clause and that tension is healthy i think what american law does is it forces us to the judiciary where we litigate our claims and where if if you're operating in bad faith eventually you're going to run out of gas until somebody else decides hey you know what I want to litigate too. And then you go, fine. You want to litigate. American law says, welcome to the courts. We're here. We'll, you'll have your day in court. We'll hear your claims. But eventually, if you're operating in bad faith, it dies out anyway. So from time to time, you're always going to have issues like this pop up in American law. And the beauty for me of American jurisprudence is that the courts stand ready to litigate these claims. And eventually, if you're operating in bad faith, you're going to run out of gas. But true to form, someone will come up later and create another controversy only to have that one fade away. But litigants come and go. But the judiciary, the American judiciary and its system of laws is always here to, to stay. Well, I guess this begs the question that, you know, we are going to probably be wrestling with for quite some time. What is the definition of a religion? You know, when do you rise up to the point where, quote unquote, you can be considered to be viable or realistic? And I guess sometimes trying to figure out how you juxtapose those two is where the battle is always going to be. And as Dr. Golden says, we'll see you in court to come to a final conclusion. <laughs> You know, ever since Roe v. Wade had basically been overturned by a particular piece of what I would call new court mandates, we are now starting to see that there is another case that's out there that's called Moyle versus the United States and Idaho versus the United States, where now we're starting to see that there are a number of states that are trying to reinterpret an old law. The law that they're really dealing with is called the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. And this is a new guidance, really, that does something that's kind of unprecedented. It requires hospital ERs to perform abortions in certain situations, even if it conflicts with the religious beliefs of a doctor or the hospital, and even if the abortion is banned by state law. You know, the federal government then ended up suing Idaho, claiming that its Defense Life Act, which ends up banning certain abortions in the state, violated federal law. Idaho is now trying to get the Supreme Court to come in and actually overrule what might be considered to be valid state law. 
You know, what we're starting to see, and I think we saw this from the very moment that the Dobbs case was decided, that we're now, quote unquote, putting it back in the hands of states. But now every state now seems to be trying to create something that they can't figure out whether it'll work. Can you take this across state lines? I mean, Todd, when you take a look at this particular case and we start to see that we're now looking at, you know, old acts trying to be reinterpreted in order to sometimes even put this square peg in a round hole as it relates to handling abortion from the federal standpoint, as opposed to from a quote unquote state perspective, how do we start to manage through this? And when do you even know if you're violating the law or not? Yeah, the law that we're talking about there that you mentioned, often referred to as EMTALA, has been around for a number of years, decades in fact. Uh, it is the law that says that when you show up to an emergency room, they have to treat you, you know, regardless if you have insurance or not, regardless of any other situation, you have to get treatment. The idea, and, and that existed before um, or, or, you know, before Dobbs came along and while Roe was still the law of the nation. It's interesting, we went decades and decades in which hospitals have never been required to perform abortions in them, right? Even with Roe, things like the Hyde Amendment, the Church Amendment, other protections, hospitals have never been required to perform abortions uh, really in any context. So now to rewrite this law that never would have passed had it been understood as an abortion mandate law and say, oh, it requires abortions now, I think is the administration sort of stretching. Many of the situations that you have that require sort of emergency intervention, for instance, like an ectopic pregnancy, even the Catholic Church does not interpret that as an abortion because mm. there's no viable, uh, you know, it's, it's anyway, for various reasons, that does not violate the church's beliefs. And so I think this is the government really trying to force something down using a law that was never intended that way, never understood that way, and never interpreted that way for decades uh, when uh, abortion was legally constitutionally, but still not required. Well, Tim Schultz, is this strange now we talked about, well, let's give it back to the states. Well, now that the states have it, it seemed like we're looking at, you know, hearing something different from probably every particular jurisdiction as they try to figure out how to juxtapose this against basically the Dobbs decision. I mean, it's going to be messy for a while. I mean, that's that's what the claim of those who wanted to over, overturn was, that this would return to the democratic processes largely. And, you know, I don't you don't when you're marketing something, you don't market the the bad parts. Right. But the, the messy parts and the messy parts of it is democracy over highly contested uh, issues that, you know, go to deep moral disagreements. Those are going to be messy when they're subjected to democratic processes. But that's, you know, I think if you would have put us under truth serum three years ago before we knew Dobbs was going to be overturned and really we asked, well, what, what will a post-Dobbs rule look like? Well, it's going to be contentious and messy. And, you know, that's, I think, should have been expected. Well, Lawrence, it's supposed to be messy, but then when you start going to states, for example, like even in New York, uh, where you had cases with the Sisters of Life there that wanted to engage in certain activities, and now we have Idaho that has some rules and regulations. The fact of the matter is, is that all of these particular jurisdictions are trying to push right back up to the Supreme Court where the decision regarding Dobbs was pretty much saying, well, it's putting back in your hands. And now the conflicts that are taking place are rising right back up to the Supreme Court again. I mean, are we just finding ourselves in this vicious circle of activity from a legal perspective with no end in sight? This is what happens when people allow ideology to drive them past Proper, proper process. Whatever you felt about Roe, whether you liked it, didn't like it, the fact remains that instead of the Supreme Court engaging in the kinds of discussion that have governed them for years, it essentially turned into a situation where they said, you know what? We got enough people to do it, so we're going to do it just because we can. And that has opened the floodgates to a lot of the foolishness that we're seeing right now. And, and here's the joke. The joke is that people allow their intense feelings about a particular subject to completely override an intelligent consideration of how do we let a thing play out in real life, in real time, in real world situations. That, that discussion has been completely absent. And so you find people um, 
abortion is wrong. And on the very heels of that, once the baby is born, there's zero support for the kind of public programs and policies that will give that, that baby that you, you, you felt so strong about being here. And I'm glad you felt strong about that baby being here. But now that the baby's here, you, you display zero interest in doing the kinds of things and supporting the kind of programs that will help that same baby, that same life that we previously said was so sacred, now that the baby's here, maybe life isn't so sacred anymore because you're not doing the things that you can legitimately do to ensure that that quote unquote sacred life has a fighting chance at becoming a productive member of society. So we have just gotten to a very bad place where folks are not interested in having the kinds of discussions that they need to be having so that we don't have 12-year-old rape victims. You know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, it just blows my mind what we are talking about versus what we're not talking about, what we should be talking about, so that however you feel about the topic, and you can feel about the topic how you want to feel, but however you feel about the topic, there's got to be a way to avoid some of the crazy outcomes that we're having right now because people just want to make the noise without engaging in the thoughtful, contemplative discussions that help us to end up with a reality that actually makes sense. You know, but Todd, this is where I struggle. You know, the idea that people are talking about, all right, Dobbs came in and overturned Roe. So now we had something that was in place, let's call it 50 years, and now there's a new quote unquote viewpoint from a legal perspective and it changes. For some reason, there's something about the, the Dobbs decision that seems to be viewed as, you know, as, as the, you know, the evil coming home to roost on a particular topic. Am I missing something here? Or is this kind of like one of those natural evolutions that we kind of see in law that take place on a periodic basis? So the problem and the difference is, you're right, Brown versus Board of Education came in while all deliberate speed was slower than most people like. We came to a national consensus. No one, you know, in the legitimate sort of public sphere would publicly say we need to go back to pre-Brown ruling. That is universal. But Roe never got that same currency. It never got that same uh, support and didn't and did not, it didn't have that same persuasive effect. And the problem is there is a morally competing interest, the life of an unborn child, mm. that is never going to go away. And you can you can say that before, you know, when it's a fetus, it has a lower protection and so forth. But at the end of the day, um, you're just never going to be able to get over that moral view. And I don't think we're ever going to solve this problem because there's also a competing moral issue there as well. And that's women having autonomy. Uh, in their reproductive rights. And those two issues are just not going to resolve themselves, unlike issues of segregation, where we did come to a consensus of the country. Not saying we've solved all racial problems by any stretch, but there is a consensus that we shouldn't segregate ourselves. Be well, sure. I hate to I hate to disagree totally with Todd because I think he's right about what he describes with Roe. I think he may be underestimating the resistance we had nationally to Brown and and everything happening around Brown. I mean, remember, uh, you know, the candidacy of George Wallace, right? Oh. I mean, remember. No, no, no. But, the, but what, what the, what's the difference, Tim, is that we don't have that same resistance, right? Yes, there was a lot of resistance to Brown, and I don't want to underestimate that all. But what I do think happened, and I think is is undeniable, is that that, that resistance publicly, you, there's a reason that George Wall, there's no George Wallace now standing in schoolhouse doors. We never had that same resistance and uh, go away with Roe. In fact, arguably resistance to Roe increased over time. You know, the, the, the scriptural version of the secular cliche, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, mm. is there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And be careful what you ask for. I mean, for years, people, pro-life advocates have pushed for the overturning of Roe, but I think a lot of them miscalculated in their passion that the overturning of Roe was not going to end abortion. It was simply going to put abortion, it's going to, it's going to take it away 
from it being a federal constitutional right, that may no longer exist. But when you put it to the political process, there's a whole lot of dust that gets kicked up. And there's a whole lot of issues that have to be settled. And the the nature of this problem, the competing interests at stake in this problem, which is the the life of the fetus and the autonomy of the mother, they're not going anywhere just because Roe was overruled. The, the post-Dobbs world is a world that's going to take some time getting accustomed to. And I think the sooner we realize that, the sooner we can start to settle in and figure out how to move forward. And I have to let that be the last word, Dr. Golden, but I think as it was pointed out by our panelists, it's gonna be messy for a while. And whenever new laws come into place that you end up having a, a religious and dare I say a political connotation attached to it, messy is gonna be probably where we are for a little while. Tim Schultz, tell me something I don't know. We now have journalists secretly recording conversations with Supreme Court justices and their wives. It's definitely protected by the First Amendment. It might not be a good civic practice because we want judges to talk to regular people. But I have to say, of all the people that have been secretly recorded, uh, Chief Justice John Roberts just sounds like a great guy. And John, if you're listening, let's do lunch sometime. <laughs> Todd, tell me something I don't know. In our first segment, we talked about chaplains and the requirements for that. The Department of Defense uh, for chaplains has a number of requirements, including educational, but one of the strictest they have is you must serve two years as a parish pastor in a congregation before you become a chaplain. Chaplaincy is a specialized form of ministry, and the base level experience is being in a local congregation and serving there before you become a chaplain. Mm, Lawrence, tell me something I don't know. Earlier, I shared with you that many corporate entities employ chaplains. Did you know that the average salary for a corporate chaplain is $91,500 a year? Didn't know that. <laughs> Tim Golden, tell me something I don't know. In the landmark Supreme Court decision Martin versus Hunter's lessee, a Justice Joseph Story, one of the leading scholars and commentators on the Constitution, wrote in ruling that the Supreme Court had plenary authority over state court judgments, that that authority was necessary to curb local prejudices. It would turn out in 1958 that when the governor of Arkansas refused to authorize Brown, those words came to fruition in a compelling way. And each member of the Supreme Court, which ruled unanimously in Cooper versus Aaron, actually signed the opinion. Wow. Gentlemen, thank you for our conversation today. It was great being with you. Thanks again for you being here with us. Hope you enjoyed our conversation. Just remember, if it's about God and government, it's faith and politics. See you next time. <laughs>